If you're ready to take your destiny into your own hands, you've come to the right place. This is The Bulletproof Entrepreneur, featuring interviews with the most exciting and amazing entrepreneur. Here's your host, Chi Odogu. Getting your team up to date on the latest skills required for success is hard work, but you don't have to worry about it anymore. Jolt is an online training platform that helps professionals and organizations access up-to-date training from practitioners at the top of their game. No more watching e-learning videos that are not interactive and may contain obsolete information when you access them. Each Jolt training is done live via interactive Skype or webinar, and the trainers are both practitioners and thought leaders in their field. So you get the latest information that can change your business at the right time. Visit jolt.us and find out how you can start getting the right training for your team today. That's www.jolt.us. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the show. Today's guest is Amy Bruski. Amy is an internationally renowned author, sales trainer, and keynote speaker. She's the president of Colby Core, a top-level consulting firm that specializes in helping family-owned businesses around the globe achieve optimal efficiency, increase profitability, and enhance their corporate and personal success. Amy rose from humble beginnings at the Jenny Craig Corporation to become a divisional supervisor responsible for sales training and operations in different regions in the United States. She's also the co-author of the book titled Business is Business, Reality Checks for Family-Owned Companies. I'm pleased to have her on the show today to help teach us about how family-owned corporations can achieve lasting success. So without further ado, Amy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. Well, uh, I am currently, as you mentioned, the president of Colby Corp. We're an entrepreneurial business with a little bit under 30 employees, and we've been around for 40 years. Um, And I'm president now of this company that actually my stepmother founded, which is interesting. We're an interesting combination of stepmother and stepdaughter working together. Uh, But before I came here, so I've been here now 23 years, I was at Jenny Craig Weight Loss Centers, which um, allowed me to, boy, learn a lot about an entrepreneurial business, but a very fast moving, fast growing, larger entrepreneurial business. And I did everything there from uh, start as a weight loss counselor trainer up to a sales trainer. And then I was a divisional supervisor over sales training and operations. My transition to Colby Corp was mostly because of life circumstances. So it was never my plan to end up working for the family business, but at the time it made a lot of sense and it ended up being it ended up feeding every passion and every interest that I have in the workplace so it's been a fabulous fit for me so let's talk a little bit about your role in Jenny Craig you were a sales trainer there now Jenny Craig is one of the biggest companies in the fitness space even up till now how did you get involved how did you get into Jenny Craig and then what were your experiences like while working as a sales trainer in Jenny Craig before you now left? Well, I was lucky enough to start when I was still in uh, finishing up my university training. So my senior year in college is when I started working there. And at the time, the business was growing so rapidly and so quickly that when they heard I was graduating, they said, great, what do you want to do here? I mean, it was almost like you could kind of write an open ticket. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people would have gotten frustrated by how chaotic things were back then. We were opening lots and lots of centers. And for a while, I even worked for the franchise department and was helping selling franchises. And then unfortunately, we had to buy some back and I was a part of that process. But uh, my sales training experience was um, making, boy, we were making up scripts and experimenting in the field and seeing what worked. And I was really able to learn so many different parts of the business. And at the time, they basically said, are you willing to move? And I said, yes. And they moved me five times in five years. So I was lucky that I got in on a ground floor, kind of in a business that was moving quickly, but I had to be willing to sacrifice where I was living. Um, I was dating my husband, um, who's still my husband at the time, but I had to put off our wedding for a while. So it was an interesting career choice, but I got to learn so much in a short period of time. And 
I had a lot of friends coming out of university that wanted a much more traditional environment and they wanted a very neat career path. And when I look back on it now, I think the fact that I was willing to just jump in and say, I'm willing to say yes to whatever they offer me because there'll be some learning down the road. All of those experiences I had have now been worth it. And I've been a better leader. I've I've been able to make better decisions about my own business when spending money and taking risks, especially by what I learned during those early years. And what you just said reminded me of something I read in a book called um, Just Say Yes by Jim Palmer, who talks about having a richer life experience when you open yourself up to new situations and circumstances by just saying yes. So I really Absolutely. Love- yeah, you know, I heard from, I, I did an interview the other day with someone who's just graduating from university and he said his brother took a job that he felt was beneath him because it's a job you could do without having a degree. And we had a very interesting conversation about what kinds of things his brother might be learning right now in the job that'll make him a better leader later. Because here he is, he's he's a younger in his career. He's probably a stereotype as a millennial. And he said, well, I guess I have to pay my dues and do the grunt work just because everybody has to do that. And I said, no, embrace that. It's not about the grunt work. I said, you will be a terrible leader somewhere down the road if you have not done these things now. Mm-hmm. So I said, you're just building a foundation for the future. It's not about just paying paying your dues in an organization so you can move up the ladder, you're actually building this kind of this war chest, this arsenal of skills and talents and decision-making abilities for the future. Yes, I agree with you. So a life situation comes along while you were having this fun adventure with Jenny Craig and you decide to come into the family business. Now, I know that must that must not have been very easy. So what were some of the challenges you faced leaving a corporate environment and Jenny Craig to come into the family business where you would pretty much be the boss's kid, but also the new kid in the office. Sure. Well, it started for me that I had been married for a while, but my husband and I had these crazy careers. He was traveling. So he was a professional baseball player in the minor leagues. So he had a job where he was constantly on the road and I was traveling 80% of the time. And we had to just meet up every once in a while on weekends to see each other. So we, we, We had to sacrifice a lot, but that was okay because we were willing to do that for our careers. But when we decided we were going to have children, we had already been married, I think, five or six years. And we said, "Okay, gosh, it's time to think about having kids. Um, You can't just put a, a career on hold when you're an athlete. Right. That wasn't an option for him. So I said, I'll step back in my career. And um, I will, you know, let's be together because we didn't want to parent children separately. So that moved me back to my hometown of Arizona temporarily. We had to set up a home base. And as I came home, my stepmother said, hey, you've been doing some sales training and we need some basic sales training. How about I pay you as a consultant, come in and do a little bit of coaching? So I said, sure, because I still wanted to work. And I came into the family business. And luckily, it was a good fit because what I had been doing is what they needed. Mm. And she made the point because she had never wanted to go out of her way to hire her own kids. Um, She said, listen, don't think you're going to have a full time job here. I'm not offering you a job. I just need some consulting. But within one week, both of us looked at each other and said, oh, my gosh, this is so great. You know, maybe we can make this maybe we can make this happen where that worked for me at the time was I said, I need flexibility to be able to work remotely and actually take some months off here and there and not work at all. Mm -hmm. And so we created a role for myself. Now, you asked a really interesting question, which was what was like what was that like to be the boss's kid? And um, I I knew immediately I had to prove myself. I had to bring something to the table or else it wasn't going to work. And I think that's the biggest mistake that entrepreneurs make when they're hiring family Mm -hmm. is they tend to hire their kids or someone who is a relative um, who either doesn't have experience that transfers or is brand new in their career. And when you come in with no work experience, you got to have at least a little bit, a few years on your own you don't have the respect of the people in the in the business and that's hard to make up later on yeah. so that's one of our biggest pieces of advice for people that are thinking of working with family is make sure that there's something that you're bringing when you come in 
how were you guys able to navigate some of the challenges that came up initially? If right. Well, we had what we started in the beginning was not having some great boundaries. And that's one of the mm -hmm. biggest challenges. So um, I came into the business and for a while, while we were deciding where we were going to live, my husband and I were in the off season, we needed to, um, I actually moved in with my parents for the first time in many years because I hadn't lived with them since I was 19 years old. And what we found ourselves doing is at the end of the day, coming home and still talking about business all night long. It was exhausting. I mean, from the time I woke up in the morning, I was working to the time I went to bed. And some of that was wonderful because I was excited about it and I was happy to be doing it. But you can't continue to do that. So we had to say, listen, when we're outside of the workplace, no matter what that looks like, if we're going out to dinner together, or if we're with our the rest of our extended family, whatever it is. We might be able to share or vent a little bit about what happened that day, but we can't solve problems together. Because once you get into problem solving mode, that requires mental energy. Mm -hmm. And that's a drain on you. A little bit different than, let's say a husband and wife work together and at the end of the day, they might just blow off steam or say, oh my gosh, do you know what happened in this meeting or whatever it might be. So that was a con of working together for sure. Um, that and frankly, when you move from a larger organization, um, I, you know, the reality is I was taking a big risk. I was taking a pay cut. I was my benefits weren't as good. I mean, some of those other things were there. But in return, what I got was tremendous flexibility to raise my kids and be a mother and work and, you know, when you're a part of a family business, we always decided that family came first. Now, we know how to create, you know, make money and uh, you know, make a profit and make sure that the business is just as important. But I was able to take a step back a little bit in my career and work fewer hours than I was used to and not travel as much. And if I had been in my old job, that would not have been possible. I would not have been able to keep my other job and do the things I wanted to do. So that was huge for me to be able to be in an environment where they respected that being a, a parent was good. Um, and frankly, I got to do a lot of different jobs. I mean, one of the things coming into the family business is I got up to speed very, very quickly. I got to step in and experience a lot of things. Is it as a result of you coming into the company that inspired you and your stepmom to write the book, Business is Business? How, how did you guys get inspired to write the book? So the book came about all these years later because I've been in the business now 23 years mm -hmm. and we work with Fortune 500 companies. So we work with the largest corporations in the country and we work with a ton of smaller entrepreneurial and especially family businesses. And it is shocking to find out that the Bureau of Labor Statistics say that up to 90% of all the businesses in the country are where people are working with family in some way. Mm -hmm. That's a huge number. And that does even, reflect even around the world too. It's almost that. Big. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So here's what started happening. I was consulting with a couple of family businesses and one situation, especially that was so incredibly painful. And what I found out from working with them is how working together as a family had not only destroyed the business. I mean, the business was on life support when I came in and started working with them, but it also had destroyed a couple of relationships mm -hmm. and people weren't, had no relationship. A husband and wife had completely split up. They hadn't been divorced yet, but they weren't living together anymore. And I came back and started talking to Kathy about it. And I said, it's unbelievable the risks that you take when you decide to work with family because you are risking the business and your personal relationships. But what we know, because we went through some trials and tribulations and we figured out how to do it and do it well, is the joy that comes from sharing success with the people you love is unbelievable and unimaginable. So when it works, it's wonderful and it's magic. When it doesn't, the stakes are incredibly high. So what we started doing is putting down on paper what was going to be a training and a retreat because that's what we do a lot of. We do a lot of half day and full day seminars for companies. Uh, and we said, you know what, let's put together a training. As we started writing what the modules for the training would be, it, we really realized it was a book. So the book is full of all of our stories of our own clients and what we've experienced with them. And we share the mistakes that we've made because we've made plenty of mistakes and we want people to be able to skip past all of that, <laughs> what we had to learn the hard way. Mm. And as you were writing this book, 
Um, I know Kathy came up with the Kobe A test, but it seems that test is pretty much one of the like the bedrock pillars of determining how a family member is going to find their place and find their way in a family organization. Is that true or am I off the mark? No, you're on the mark. What we've done in the book is created a framework of three different parts of the mind. So Plato and Aristotle even talked about there's these three dimensions of the mind that make up a person. There's your skills and your knowledge and experience, which go into what we call the cognitive dimension. Then there's your personality type, your motivation and what your values are, kind of what you want to do and what you desire, which goes into the affect. And then the third part of the mind is what Kathy disco- discovered how to measure. It's been around for, since ancient philosophers, but it's called the conative, C-O-N-A-T-I-V-E. That is the part of the mind that's about the doing. So think about it as the thinking, the feeling, and the doing. Mm. Well, the doing is about an instinctive need that we all have to take action in a certain way. And when you're looking at bringing in a family member into the business, you have to say, is it the right fit for their skills or their potential abilities? Is it the right fit? Do we share common values? Is this right for what they want to do? Is this something that they love? I loved Colby Corp. I loved human behavior and the business of figuring out how to get more done and productivity. So that was a great fit for me. It fit my values and what I cared about. And then that third dimension is when I discover how this person naturally gets things done, is there a good fit for those talents? Because the worst thing that you can do is put someone in a role that's a terrible fit for their talents and know that they also don't have a future role in the company where they can do that. So for example, for you, one of the things I know about your skills and your talents is you're great as an entrepreneur and you're great when things are really adaptable. If I put you into a role and say, come on in and be finance full time in our business, that's a terrible thing to do to a family member. Put them in a position where you might be capable and have the skills to do it Mm -hmm. um, and you might be committed to the business, but long term, that's going to be so painful for you and eventually it's not going to work out. So we walk people through the process of figuring out the fit in all three parts of the mind. And when you walk them through this process and uh, take, for example, a dad is bringing in his son because most dads want their sons to join the family business and take over, you know, the line of succession. And they see this result and they say, okay, my son may not be well suited to actually be the head of the organization. Have you ever had any difficult conversations like that with former clients? And then how were you able to navigate and manage some of the challenges that arose as a result of um, the son realizing that, hey, he might not want to take over and the dad hearing the information that he might not be the best person to actually lead the organization when he steps down? Yes. Oh, boy, have we had that often. Um, And it's a tricky conversation. But if we go at it with the best interests of everyone being in a position to be a, a great fit and contribute, then people are open to it. Now, one of the things is we don't always know up front if just by doing an assessment on how that son most naturally takes action that they're not the best fit. Because just let's say they're opposite of the father. Well, the father started a business, let's say. But that doesn't mean the son can't have this different result. What it does mean is the father might not be the best mentor for this person. Mm -hmm. And the father's got to be open to the fact that that son may run the business in a very different way than he did. And that's so we have to start with that. Do we have the freedom to be ourselves in this business? And if so, does this son really want to be a leader? Because I got to tell you, so much of the time, the next generation is doing it out of guilt Mm. and feeling that they need to. So we got to figure out how much does he want to, and then we can coach that person on being a leader that's unique to that person's strengths versus asking them to be different. There are also times when we say, you know, gosh, I don't know that this is the best business for this person or maybe being CEO isn't best, but that doesn't mean the person can't be the COO or in charge of um, client relations or charge of sales or whatever it might be. So what we do is go in and find a niche where that person's going to be happy and they still might be an owner, but they don't always have to be CEO. And you know what I find is people have a lot of bias 
And you've got these biases toward, well, it's always going to be the oldest son. And then they overlook the daughter who mm-hmm. actually is the better fit and wants to be there. There's, so there's birth order bias, there's gender bias, all of those kinds of things. So we kind of get in there and challenge some of that uh, and help, you know, help the business thrive through the strengths of the people. What are some of the principles to ensure that um, there's success in family business when you bring in um, kids or siblings or extended family members? Okay, so the first one, and a little bit of this is review, is make sure it's a great, a good fit and that you are building a business on strengths. Another one is, as the leader of the business, you got to trust your instincts. You have to learn to trust your instincts and follow those to make decisions. And start. it starts with you. We often say it's kind of like when you're on an airplane and the flight attendant says if – you know, if the, the cabin loses oxygen, put on your mask first. You have to figure out what you want to do and what your future is and then build a business around you and your strengths, not the way you feel like you should be. And then, as I mentioned, one of the biggest things that destroys relationships is not having boundaries. Mm. So you have to have basic boundaries like when we're at work, we're at work. It's not personal. So we called the book Business is Business. Because we wanted to make the distinction that business is business and family is family. So when we're at work, as silly as this sounds, you cannot call your dad, dad. Mm -hmm. You have to call him by his first name because that immediately sets the tone for the rest of the family. You don't talk about personal things at work. And when you're on personal time, you don't talk about work things. So those relationships um, have to remain separated and that helps the people in the business who aren't family members also feel comfortable. And then one of the other things is thinking about developing the next generation. So we talk a lot about a sustainable business means that you are developing the next generation from a very young age. And so we talk about how to create problem solvers from a very young age. It start, I mean, it can start at three, four, five. And if they don't come into the business, great. But at least you've been raising children that know how to solve problems, are independent, understand their strengths. So if you think someday down the road you might want family members to be in the business, then you should start working on that at a young age. Um, So that's key. And then the last thing I would say is there's a lot of transitioning of the business to the next generation, and that gets very tricky because entrepreneurs have to find a way to exit the business gracefully. Mm -hmm. And that's really hard if you don't have anything else that you want to do next. So what we've got is a younger generation ready to take over the business, and really they never actually get an opportunity to flourish. So there's got to be some understanding of what does exiting the business look like and You know, most people aren't retiring anymore. They still want to be productive. So that means you're going to have to find something else to do with those amazing creative talents that you have, but you got to let the next generation um, take over. But ultimately, I would say the number one thing is there better be a really good reason to get involved and work with a family member. Make sure you're really clear about that because if it doesn't work, you need to discuss the exit the exit um, strategy up front. And we had that. My stepmother, Kathy, and I, we talked about it ahead of time. We said, if this doesn't work for any reason, how are we going to split up and what does that look like? So we kind of went in assuming it wouldn't work so that we had a plan that didn't, um, you know, allow for our relationship to be um, destroyed as a result of it. Hmm. Reflecting on that, when you mentioned things about boundaries, I thought about in investment banking, there's a principle called the Chinese wall where they try to separate what um, debt capital markets versus equity. I mean, because my fi- my background is in finance, I know that basically what they're trying to say is if you're writing, for example, a research report advising clients to buy a stock, you can be writing that report based off of what another part of the firm is doing you mm-hmm. understand so uh, yes sometimes this might be easy to say but it's um sometimes hard to implement so how can people start actually implementing those boundaries separating work life from family life because it it will creep in and bleed into each other when you least expect it 
Mm -hmm. Well, and I find that a lot with um, husband and wives and siblings working together. Mm -hmm. So a brother sister kind of relationship. And you already have these years of, you know, kind of experiences on how you both do things and, you know, take things personally or whatever it might be. So um, you have to start hopefully by owning your own part of the business. I, what I work with my brother every single day, he's the CEO and I'm the president of the business. And we pretty much run all the day to day operations here. And I say one of the only reasons that this works is that we kind of stay in our own lane. He has things that he does very, very well and naturally. And he kind of owns, so to speak, a certain part of the business. And I have completely different skills. So we don't cross over very much. I know when it has to do with finance or law, because my brother's a lawyer too, I know that's his stuff. And he knows when it comes to sales and client relations and training, you know, that's mine. So it starts with kind of trying very hard not to have crossover decision making. Mm -hmm. Not that you won't collaborate, Mm -hmm. because I think you should collaborate. But don't force collaborative decision making just for the sake of always people being involved. So the more you can define what who owns what, that's key. And then honestly, it just takes a lot of practice. It takes kind of laughing about it. And when after hours, all of a sudden you something creeps over or during the workday, you start you know, going down a path of something being personal, you got to draw the line. And that's when the other people you work with, if you have a business that's at the size where you have non-family members there, if you really respect them and want to make sure they're comfortable, you got to keep those boundaries going or else it makes them uncomfortable when they start seeing into the personal lives. They feel better if when you're at work, you're at work and it's professional. Mm. And how should family businesses handle conflicts of interest that may arise in the course of doing business? Right. Oh, my gosh. That is key. And I will say... One fundamental thing that's going to help you deal with that more easily is if you share values. And oftentimes people just assume that because you grew up together or your extended family that you have similar values. And Kathy will always say, just because you grew up going to church together does not mean that you have the same business values. So when it comes to a decision that has to be made in the business, if you're not sharing values and what does ethical business practice look like and what are we going to do when we're making decisions about money, that can be even trickier. So I hope go into business with people where you feel pretty confident you share business values. Don't assume you got to ask questions and have a conversation. So beyond that, as far as conflicts of interest, I think this is where you need some third party experts. You need your third party advisors outside of the business who are really objective sometimes to help you with those things. Because you don't always see every once in a while, you won't even see when it's a a conflict. Mm -hmm. But when you do see it, I I believe that having some outside advisors that you really trust helps you work through those decisions. Mm. And now, could you give us an example of a very challenging case? I mean, you don't have to mention the names or anything, but uh, just break down a challenging case of where a family business was having like a significant problem and they hired you guys to come and help them walk through some of the challenges and how you implemented some advice and the results that came out as a result of following your advice. Sure. Well, I can share one story with you and this is not This is pretty similar to some of the things that we see we're bringing in the next generation. Uh, A father who started feeling some urgency to get out of his financial advising firm, and he had been incredibly successful. And he kept saying to me, I think the timing's perfect because my son just finished his master's degree in business. So he, he finished his MBA program. And he was at the point in his life where he had just gotten married and ready to have a serious career. And um, he said, you know, my son and I are so similar. We really enjoy being together. This is going to be great. And now I can retire. So he, number one, he was trying to speed up the process. But what he hadn't done is figured out, would this be a good fit or not? And so the son started coming into the business with no real work experience. Yes, he had an MBA. And by the way, he was incredibly bright and had always gotten straight A's. But one of the things that we found is his ability to do well in school did not translate into fabulous skills as a financial advisor. Mm. And the dad was spectacular at selling. Right. He was just a natural salesperson, personality wise, and he was a risk taker. And the son had the complete opposite talents. 
So he, by the time we came in, the son was there. He was failing. He wasn't bringing in any sales as he was supposed to. And their clients had gotten really upset because the father kept forcing the son on important clients and just telling them, here you go. This guy's going to be taking over for me. And he didn't have the respect of any of the clients or any of the staff members. So the son came in very entitled and started kind of bossing everybody around. So he immediately put him in a position where he was a leader, which made no sense because he hadn't he hadn't really earned the respect of anyone, nor did he have the skills and the talents to be doing the things that he was putting in there. But the worst part about all of this was um, the father was getting to the point where he realized he was probably going to have to let the son go. It wasn't a good long-term fit, but the, his spouse, his, the mom, basically in this environment, was really upset. She thought this was horrible, and of course he could work it out, and you need to stick it out. And so he then had a whole personal issue going on with mom who was um, – getting involved in decision making in the business, right? Because of course they have these, these personal decisions. So we went in immediately and did an assessment of, you know, did the son even want to be there and what was ideal fit for him? And we had to build him back up a little bit because at this point he had started very confident and kind of gotten beaten down. So we worked with the son independently and then we worked with the father to see what was the real end game that he wanted. And there was two things. He wanted to grow the business so his son could run it. But mostly that was just because he thought that would be great for the son. Um, he wanted to get out of the business in, you know, five years. He kind of had this expedited way of getting out. And he thought the only solution was to hand it over to the son because of the clients. So we did a client analysis and we walked them through some of what would be in the best interest. And luckily it became clear to everyone that it wasn't a good fit. And so... The decision became obvious and we were able to coach them to a better resolution. Hmm. Okay. And my last question on this topic is when it comes to um, succession planning and intergenerational handoff from, take for example, there are very few companies that have existed as long as, let's say, a Johnson & Johnson that's still a family-run business. You know, I don't know if you have the statistics, but it's fr from something I read a long time ago. It said a lot of family businesses do not um, survive past the third generation. Mm -hmm. um, is that as a result of um, <coughs> legacy infrastructures in place that are resistance to change and innovation? And uh, if that's not the case, then how can... Um, family businesses be um, reorganized to help them su succeed from um, the generational handover in the long term? Mm -hmm. Well, um, yes, I think the statistic I've seen most often is that only about 12% of family owned businesses make it to the third generation. Mm -hmm. And um, the statistics that I've seen for the reasons for that is the number one reason is problems with communication and trust at about 60% of the reasons. 25% is lack of preparation for the next generation. And then all the other issues around poor tax or financial planning, legal issues is only about 15%. And yet most of the advice that we see out there in the books written on family business, it's all about the finances mm -hmm. and it's about how to transfer wealth. And it, it's that those 15%. So I think if you focus on communication, trust, and having a vision for how can family members make it in the business. It's not about forcing it to the next generation. If there's no real um, obvious choice for the next generation, then you have to think about maybe having the next generation involved on the board. Mm -hmm. So maybe they're helping make the decisions, but that doesn't mean they have to be there executing every day. So communication, trust, and the right fit, if those are being handled, I think you have a much better chance of moving it to the next generation. Because frankly, entrepreneurs are such an interesting breed. They're so passionate about what they do. They sacrifice so much. And they basically, we talk about 
entrepreneurs, uh, their business as being their baby. That's exactly what it is. It is their baby. They've created it oftentimes from scratch. So what are the chances that two generations from now, they will still love this baby as much as this entrepreneur did? Not, Not likely. So we have to assume that's okay and do something with that and still sustain a business knowing that it can't look like it did in the beginning. As we transition to wrapping up, so what gets you fired up in the morning to come to work? Oh, boy, that one's easy. (laughs) Um, From the time I was really young, I was very fascinated by human behavior and why do people do things the way they do it. And I wanted to study psychology in college, but I thought, well, that's not very practical because I don't want to be a therapist. So for me to have found a business, so I got a business degree and I loved business. I, I, business is very practical to me. It makes sense. I like the challenge of it, but what I'm really passionate about is helping people discover their own unique talents and strengths and putting those to work in ways that matter to them most. So if that's to improve their relationships, great. If that's to improve their business, fabulous. If that's to be a better team leader, great. We can help with those kinds of things. So I get to see changes being made every day and we get to make a difference every day in people's lives. So it's fabulous when people say, gosh, you just gave me a piece of information that's going to change everything or that's going to reduce my stress or that's going to change my business. So I get to do that daily and and I love it. And I was very fortunate to have found something that married all of those things together. But when I look back on it, it was also understanding myself enough to make good choices along the way. So I'm hoping that your listeners take that a little bit and say, what is that for you? What do you know about your talents? What do you know about your strengths and what's unique about you? And build a career around that. It's possible. There's a lot of choices out there. Yeah. And... uh... Who's an entrepreneur you admire and why do you admire that person? Oh, boy. Um, Well, I would have to say, just because it's near and dear to my heart, that my stepmother, Kathy Colby, is someone that I've learned so much from because she was someone who grew up dyslexic, so challenged to learn, um, started her business, and at some point got in a horrible, horrific car accident where she couldn't read and write anymore. And so I met her a few years after that, but to see someone with that can-do spirit and how she learned to come back, and she lear- she used not being able to cognitively learn to figure out how to tap into these natural instincts that you have and use that to your advantage and build a business around that. And so one of the things that I've admired about her is to be able to see everything as a learning situation. Mm -hmm. And her definition of success is the freedom to be yourself. And I'd never really thought about that. But once I started seeing what does that look like in practice, I started realizing that that's so important is that success is defined not by how much you've um, acquired or how big your business is. None of that matters if you don't have the freedom to be yourself. So I've I've admired and respected the way that she's built a business from nothing and how she's dealt with adversity. And you mentioning your stepmom's story just brought to my mind the book titled The Obstacle is the Way, which basically narrated a lot of the stories about different people who had to overcome um, significant life challenges. And what was inspiring in that book was that each obstacle revealed a different way that they could apply their strengths to solving problems in their lives, like your stepmom, for example, couldn't learn the traditional way. So she had to figure out, okay, if I can't learn based on the framework that we've been taught in school, there, there must have been a lot of way to do it before this framework was built. And then she tapped into that natural, instinctive way and used that to learn. Absolutely, yes. And um, could you talk about a significant personal failure and how you recovered from it? Oh, boy. Um, 
there, there certainly have been plenty, but there have been times when I can think of one particular time where I had not prepared significantly for a, a presentation and it was going to be for an incredibly important client. And this was an organization that did thermal in, imaging for the government and for private companies and almost everyone on the senior leadership team were ex-military, you know, very high ranking people. And um, I had come in the night before and I had my whole presentation prepared and I had it prepared for what I would traditionally do. And I met with the CEO and he basically told me that everyone in the room that had just been meeting with him were saying they didn't want to be a part of my presentation. They thought it was ridiculous. They couldn't believe that they were going to spend time on this. Um, and I had just set it up completely incorrectly. And I basically had a hostile environment that I was going into. So, you know, the biggest failure on my part in this case was not understanding my audience and not adjusting. I'd kind of gotten comfortable with a lot of what I was delivering to my clients and I had stopped, I had stopped customizing it enough and understanding what their needs were. So that night I stayed up Oh boy, pretty much all night. I completely changed what I was doing. I went to the local printer. I got all of our research printed out and I started with the data and the facts and the research. And I normally wouldn't do that, but I realized that I had an integrity problem or a credibility issue with this group and they were never going to listen to me if I didn't satisfy their need for um, information and why they should spend their time this way. So in the end, I was able to save it. Um, but I had miscalculated and I think I had just gotten very comfortable with the way I'd been doing things and I misread my audience and it could have been even more of a disaster. Luckily, by the time I actually got in front of these people, I was able to save it and it was a great client and we had good long-term success with that organization. And Looking back on your career, is there anything you think you would have done differently knowing what you know now? Oh, that's a good question. So looking back on my career, the only thing that I could say is um, I wish I had kind of trusted my instincts early on in my career. Uh, you know, people have everything they need to be successful inside of them right now. There is this mental energy and this force you have that if you would trust it a little bit more, you would be doing some of your best decision making. And early on when I was with at Jenny Craig, I was trying to emulate people who I saw in positions that I wanted and I was behaving in ways that were so different than what were natural for me. And it, and it, it wasn't, um, you know, it, it doesn't ring true to people. It's, and I wasn't myself and it was incredibly stressful. And so I was, boy, I was stressed out and sick and I was traveling. I woke up one morning, just like people tell the story where you wake up on the road and you have no idea what city you're in. And I had to look at the telephone, um, because I was working even harder really than I needed to, to mm -hmm. kind of make up for what, how I thought I needed to be. And the minute I tapped into who I was and kind of let go of needing to be um, a certain way and say, maybe my path isn't going to be this straight line up the road. I started um, accepting and saying yes to other things and not just following one person. So I had had role models I was trying to be, and I needed to open up my horizons to who I could be in the organization, not just trying to like play pretend to be somebody else. Mm -hmm. And the final question of the evening, um, it's, wow, well, we're at the end of June and about roughly a month ago in May, a lot of people were graduating from school, you know, thinking of getting that first job out of college or it's even close to the beginning or the middle of summer, depending on how you look at it. And people are thinking, okay, after the summer break, when fall starts, what am I going to do with my life? So for people in a transitionary phase of their life, what's um, the word of advice you'd want to give those people? Yeah, that's, it's a, it's a nerve wracking time in your life. I have a 21 year old son, so he's going to be a senior next year in school. It's also really exciting because you're still in a, in a phase where you could do just about anything. Um, one of the things that I would say is 
make sure that you are open to experiences and don't feel like you have to plan your whole life. I think people come out of college and think they have to have the whole career plan figured out. I think take, look at what's in front of you, take some experiences, you know, say yes to some things. And with knowing that in your head, you say, what's the worst case scenario? I'm going to take this job. And if it doesn't work out for me, what's the worst case scenario? And what am I going to do as a result of that? I think people are much more willing to take risks and take action if they have at least some contingency plan, if it doesn't go perfectly or as planned. But know that Every one of those situations are learning experiences. And I think the number one thing you have to do, and believe me, I know this is really, really difficult, is stop listening to everybody else around you and what they're doing. You're a unique individual. You have unique gifts and strengths. And what works for another person is not necessarily going to work for you. So seek out people that have similar um, goals and visions, not necessarily in a career, but just for what they want out of life and have your people, your go-to people that you can brainstorm with, but ultimately go carve out your unique path and don't be afraid to say yes to things. You don't have to commit to the same career for the rest of your life. Just go out and experience things. Hmm. Uh, Amy, where can people get the book and learn more about you and your company? Well, the book is available on any of the places that you would buy online. So the book is called Business is Business by Kathy Colby with a K, Kathy and K-O-L-B-E and Amy Bruski, B-R-U-S-K-E. And you can find it on Amazon, CEO Read, um, any of those kinds of places and some of your local bookstores. And if you go to colby.com, K-O-L-B-E.com, you can find out more about what we do with career coaching, um, work in businesses. We help entrepreneurs make decisions on who they're going to hire. And there's also links there to get the book as well. Yes. And I would also advise that you take the uh, Colby A test. I took the test right before I hopped on the call with Amy. And um, to say that I was, I wouldn't say surprised, but I was shocked to see myself in print was an understatement because things that I know I do, I didn't think it was so much codified in such a way that after taking a test i'd be able to recognize myself on paper so um taking the test it's really good because you get to know your strengths and your weaknesses and you can use that to now help you structure what you want to do with um you know your calling and your gift in life so i think it's also a very good test it's uh it's very funny because i was telling amy that it's almost um lines up with the Myers-Briggs test but that was for me it lined up for many people it might not line up but it's a good thing to have and it's a good thing to know where your strengths and weaknesses are absolutely thank you for that Amy thank you for coming and sharing your story and um, teaching us a little bit more about how we as entrepreneurs can work with our family members in order to have a successful family business you're welcome thank you so much for having me Don't let another minute go by without taking action to change your life. Visit Ordeshi.com right now for more incredible resources. And we'll see you next time on Ordeshi, the Bulletproof Entrepreneur.